So I'm going to give a semi-brief summary of the history of sexuality. I'm going to spend a good bit of time on the introduction, speed through part two and three, and then sell in on part four, because that's where he talks about power, which is important in relation to the other articles that we read. Okay, so part one, um, We Other Victorians, is where he um, basically states his thesis and outlines the project that he'll be undergoing for the rest of the book. Um, Foucault introduces his history by observing that we have told ourselves that beginning in the 17th century, reaching its apogee in the 19th, and thus neatly coinciding with the development of capitalism, quote, on the subject of sex, silence became the rule, and nothing that was not ordered in terms of generation or transfigured by it could expect sanction or protection, nor did it merit a hearing, end quote. The success of capitalism, the story goes, required that pleasure be kept to a minimum so that energy could be channeled to maximize profit from labor. The repression of sex was thus a tool for the ruling classes to control and subjugate the rest of the population. If this is an accurate narrative, and for Foucault this is a big if, that modern Western society operates on a powerful injunction not to speak of sex, then the path to liberation would seem to lie in doing just the opposite, breaking that taboo by speaking. Foucault finds this persistent urge to speak about the supposed repression of sex to be ironic, since talking about the repression of sex is indeed a manner of talking about sex. He also makes note of the appeal of what he terms the repressive hypothesis, appeal which further calls into question the accuracy of that hypothesis. After all, there, after all, there is, Foucault argues, a kind of pleasure in appearing transgressive. The appearance in which depends upon the very repression that transgression supposedly undoes. Repression and liberation seem curiously codependent, and thus speaking about sex more is a tactic not likely to produce significant social change. So instead of seeking to directly disprove this repressive hypothesis, Foucault seeks to redefine the problem by putting the repressive hypothesis itself and this, this is Foucault, back within a general economy of discourses on sex in modern societies since the 17th century. So, his question that he's asking, that he will attempt to be answering in this volume, the question I would like to pose is not, this is Foucault speaking, why are we repressed, but rather, why do we say, with so much passion and so much resentment against our most recent past, against our present and against ourselves, that we are repressed? The answer to Foucault's rephrased question is a historical one, and it is the project of his book. So part two, the repressive hypothesis, um, is where he basically argues that the repressive hypothesis doesn't actually describe history as it actually was, or actually happened. Um, his argument in the first chapter, the incitement to discourse, is essentially that there was an incitement to discourse, what he calls a veritable discursive explosion, in his terms, um, those are his terms, not silence, and, and that the Christian pastoral, or confession, is the key to understanding the compulsion to talk and to talk more about sex. The second chapter is the perverse implantation, um, in which he argues that heterosexual marriage shifted around the 18th century from being explicitly regulated by canonical law, the Christian pastoral, and civil law, to operating as a norm. Um, one that, a norm that was stricter than the earlier explicit laws, um, but quieter. Heterosexual marriage was thus tacitly accepted as the natural, leaving the near infinitude of possibilities outside of its borders as the unnatural or perverse, now in need of being named or implanted in the discourse so that they could be disciplined and regulated. So part three, is Sancia Sexualis, that's my murdering of the Latin. Science of Sexuality is what I'll call it from here on out. Um, so in this section, Foucault argues that the 19th century uh, saw the development of a science of sexuality, which he argues was very bad science as science goes, since it was marked less by a will to knowledge than by a stubborn will to non-knowledge complicated by the fact that sex was constituted as a problem of truth. 
indeed a problem of the deepest truth about ourselves. Furthermore, the science of sexuality was less the application of enlightenment rationality and methodology than it was a reconstitution of the sexual confession in scientific terms, and specifically in medical terms. So, part four is the heavy part. Um, this is my interpretation of it. So, no guarantees that it's 100% correct, but we're going to go with it. Um, and argue about it later. The deployment of sexuality. This is a section where it delves into a reassessment of how we think about power and its relationship to this discursive explosion that he talks about earlier, this explosion of um, sexual discourses. Chapter one, he entitles objective, his objective, which he doesn't state until chapter two, um, not in this chapter, uh, is to analyze a certain form of knowledge regarding sex, not in terms of repression or law, but what he suggests is even more basic in terms of power. Theories of power, however, which imagine it as a substance possessed and exercised solely by a sovereign through the law, what Foucault calls the juridico-discursive representation of power, don't enable us to get at why we have directed the question of what we are to sex, to the search for the truth of sex. He concludes that we must at the same time conceive of sex without the law and power without the king. So chapter two, he entitles Method. Um, here he offers what he terms his analytics of power and he distinguishes this quite self-consciously from a theory of power. Um, this analytics of power is one in which law, sovereignty, and domination are the terminal forms or perhaps effects of power, not the locus of power as such. Power is not a thing that exists on its own, but rather something that is produced. Um, and these are Foucault's words, from one moment to the next, at every point, or rather in every relation, from one point to another. It is thus specific to each particular situation and relationship, something that he says comes from below and is exercised in relationships but does not result from any one individual's conscious decisions. He says there are no headquarters of power. Yet the interaction of these exercises of power in relation produces a mobile, flexible, and at least theoretically ever-changing network of power relations. He argues that we should therefore immerse the expanding production of discourse on sex in the field of multiple and mobile power relations. What exactly that means, hopefully we'll talk about later. So chapter three, he entitles Domain. Um, here he says that the 19th century in particular saw what he calls four great strate uh, strategic unities that took on a consistency and gained an effectiveness in the order of power as well as a productivity in the order of knowledge. Um, and this connection between power and knowledge is something that seems really important and that hopefully we can dig into a little bit in discussion. Um, okay, so these strategies that he identifies are one, a hysterization of women's bodies, a pedagogization of children's sex, a socialization of procreative behavior, and a psychiatrization of perverse pleasure. These strategies of knowledge power, again, hopefully we'll figure out what that means later, in effect produce sexuality as it was deployed in discourse. For Foucault argues that sexuality is not something that exists as an essence prior to the discourses which produce it, but rather it is the name that can be given to a historical construct. Yet the deployment of this historical construct, sexuality, overlaps with and interpenetrates, those are his words, an older construct, the deployment of alliance. The interchange of these two alliances is the family. And Foucault argues that the tensions between the two, the um, deployment of alliance and the deployment of sexuality, help explain why from the 19th century forward, in particular, finding the truth of sex became such a critical project. Chapter four, he calls periodization, and here he attempts to trace a historical arc um, of the deployment of sexuality, both the deployment of its techniques and those te techniques spread and application. Foucault argues that the middle of the 16th century was critical for the development of the Christian pastoral or confession, the end of the 18th 
um, marked a distinct move toward secular or state concern with sex, and of a particular and of particular importance, um, the beginning of the 19th century marked a critical period for the medicalization of the confession and of sexual sin, the science of sexuality and the perverse implantation talked about earlier. Historicizing the ways in which these techniques were applied and how they spread reveals not only class differentiations in the time and manner in which sexuality was deployed, um, it also reveals that these techniques originate with the concerns of the bourgeoisie, in particular a concern with bourgeois women. Furthermore, taking a final blow to the repressive hypothesis, Foucault argues that the deployment of sexuality was not established as a principle of limitation of the pleasures of others by what have traditionally been called the ruling classes. Rather, it appears to me that they first tried it on themselves. And only after the deployment of sexuality permeated all classes near the end of the 19th century, and perhaps because of that widespread deployment, did the bourgeoisie begin to argue that their own sexuality had been unduly repressed. The beginning of the repressive hypothesis. Um, and I guess the deployment of that into this course. Okay, so the final part, um, part five, the right of death and power over life, um, is where Foucault argues that from the 17th century forward, there was a shift from the sovereign as the one with the power to require the death of his subjects, the right of death, to the state as the apparatus with the function of administering life, the power over life. Administering life is an objective, Foucault argues, which requires that the state, first of all, subjugate bodies, and second, control populations, two projects which merged through the 18th century. The deployment of sexuality was one of the technologies that merged these two techniques of power. These techniques, subjugating bodies and controlling populations, were present at every level of the social body and played a part in producing new social hierarchies. This was, Foucault argues, a new era of biopower, in which the law surrendered much of its regulatory and disciplinary power to the action of the norm. In conclusion, anticipating his critics, Foucault argues that, um, I'm sorry, Foucault denies that his history ignores material realities, particularly the reality of sex. While he denies any prediscursive content to the word sex, he argues that bodies must and will be made, quote, visible through an analysis in which the biological and the historical are not consecutive to one another, but are bound together, end quote. Furthermore, he leaves his readers with cues for countering the problem, which has now been identified not as a repression of sex, but as the deployment of sexuality. The end. Biddy Martin, author of Feminism, Criticism, and Foucault, begins her article with the proclamation that Foucault's polemics, methodological breaks, and provocations create an environment for feminist political and theoretical projects to thrive, especially in the way that radical and lesbian feminists have rejected the notion that economics outweighs ideological conditions of oppression. Martin argues that materialist approaches to sexuality, subjectivity, and power can provide a way out of a theoretical and strategic impasse in all attempts to relate the abstractions, patriarchy, and capitalism, and that suspension and that suspension of universal claims is essential in determining power structures. Martin believes that current conceptions of capitalism obscure power relations at the level of the local and everyday, which is in opposition to sovereign groups, and sees power as originating outside of and independent of the concrete social interactions and their material effects. Put simply, Foucault's idea that things start at the bottom through relationships is lost in current conceptions of capitalism, according to Biddy. Biddy recounts Foucault's main points and cautions feminists to not be seduced by the work of Foucault, as the implications of it could be misunderstood. Foucault's work, however, opens up space for certain feminist questions. She points to critiques of the women's movement, fragmentation, lack of organization, absence of a coherent and en encompassing theory, and the inability to mount a front attack as representative of responses to the current failed power structure and of Foucault's notion of multiplicity of force relations instead of one centralized power source. Martin also states that it's important that we understand and take account of the ways in which we are implicated in power relationships and the fact that we are never outside of power, a furthering of Foucault's point. 
She also points out that there is a tendency to place women outside culture, which places women into strange, into a strange relationship between identity and discourse. In creating a theory for women, there is the problem of both wanting to deconstruct certain theories and to construct a theory for women which is not universalizing. Martin criticizes Foucault for not taking into account women's situations, especially in regards to secrecy and truth, nor does he implicate how women's struggles may function under, po under power structures. She also argues for finding an alternate approach and viewpoint to figure out sexual differences and the meaning of women. To elucidate her point, she turns to a biographical study of Lou Andrea Salome, who is noted for her lack of ability to fit into historical sexual discourses, not feminist, nor non-feminist, nor anti-feminist. Although she is remembered as either the seductress saturated with sex or as the virtually unsexed and exceptional mind, and reduced to categories of phallocentric thought, this study can be used to change the discourse between because, ultimately, Andrea Salome is none of these portrayals, but that all of her biographers reproduce the patterns which characterize her relation to male systems, and classified her sexual identity in the attempt to normalize and control. Martin sees Andrea Salome's inability to fit into neat historical representations of femininity as a way that feminist thinkers could provide us with a key to the limitations of our own conceptualizations. In Foucault on Power, A Theory for Women, Nancy Hartsock heavily criticizes Foucault for his white male Eurocentric viewpoint, even if his sympathies lie within the oppressed, and that, because of his status, he will never be able to provide a theory of power for women. Hartsock introduced Albert... Inter uh, bleh, Hartsock, Hartsock introduces Albert Memmi's theories in the book The Colonizer and the Colonized to imagine a future for feminism in pro-structuralism. Memmi's argument is that the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized destroys both of them. The colonized is everything the colonizer is not. The colonized becomes the other, is seen as opaque, is dehumanized, and all of the colonized look alike. Hartsock also implies Nancy G's oh, Hart, I can't talk anymore. Hartsock also employs Nancy J's principles on identity, contradiction, and the excluded middle, such that A is A, nothing can be both A and not A, and that everything is either A or not A, to further conclude that Foucault thinks he is the transcendent and omnipotent theorizer who can persuade himself that he exists outside time and space and power relations. But to Hartstock, this is erroneous. Instead, she claims that he is the colonizer who refuses, a term invented by Memmi, to define someone who rejects the dominant position but still cannot see from the point of view of the colonized. Therefore, regardless of his sympathy for women, this is Foucault, Therefore, regardless of Foucault's sympathy for women, or the working class, or people of African origin, because he cannot be them, he cannot speak for them. Hartsock also blames Foucault for not imagining a future, a way out for the subjugated. He only points to the problem and to a generalized call to resistance of power. He also fails to explain clearly what he means by power. His work creates a kind of blaming of the victim in his articulation of power that comes from the bottom, something Martin also mentions, and that his proclamation that power is everywhere ends up homogenizing power and making it exist nowhere. Hartsock's true answer to Foucault comes in her conclusion where she describes specific pathways for feminists to follow. First, that we need to acknowledge our ability to become the makers of history, not just the subjects or objects, as well as avoid universalist claims. Second, we need to find an epistemological base to discover how power relations actually work. Third, we need to bring our daily lives into theory. Here, she also calls for standpoint theory specifically. Fourth, we need to recognize the challenges of creative alternative power structures and theories, and lastly, she calls for political action. Let's change the world.